In August 1977, strange things began to happen in a quiet North London suburb. They were terrified, which is something that you can't really fake. It got progressively more and more violent. These unusual and sometimes terrifying happenings were to last many months and would become known as the Enfield Poltergeist. We were, we were, were we all going to die? Matches would set a light in the box. Bed would tip on their side. Among those who witnessed events were BBC journalists and the police. I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair and I could find no explanation at all. Why? Why us? Why did it happen to us? Why were we the chosen ones? This is the strangest, weirdest story that I've ever covered. Some of the evidence is controversial. Just because the girls weren't actually caught red-handed in the act clearly doesn't rule out the possibility that they were down to hoaxes and trickery. But 30 years on, it remains the most well-documented and puzzling case of its kind. And maybe the first time that a spirit voice has been captured on tape. No 11-year-old girl could speak like that. He didn't feel he was in control. <laughs> On the evening of the 31st of August 1977, the Hodgson family of Green Street, Enfield, were preparing for bed. It started in the back bedroom. Uh, the chest of drawers started to shut. We could hear shuffling and um, Mum came up the stairs. Oh, she said, no, I want you to pack it up and stop fighting. If I have any more of it, I'm going to separate you or something. We told her what was going on, and she see it for herself. She see the chest of drawers moving. And when she tried to push it back, she couldn't. She realised then that something wasn't right. I think we was awake all that night, all of us, and there was bits and bobs going on the wall and strange little noises in the house. And no one was doing it. We couldn't make out what was going on. By the next day, my mum was exhausted. She was emotional, nearly a wreck, you know. But she held it together for us and she said, oh, come on there. We got on our coats and slippers in our night clothes and we went to my next door neighbour, Vic and Peggy Nottingham. And Vic came at the door, he said, you're all right, mate, because he was a big, burly bloke, he used to be a builder. He weren't scared of nothing. Vic listened to the Hodgson story and went next door to see for himself what was happening. <laughs> I went in there and um, I couldn't make out these noises. I went up the stairs and there was um, a knocking on the wall. There was a knocking in the bedroom. I passed into the next bedroom and this knocking followed me. I was beginning to get a little bit frightened, just couldn't make out what it was. And we stand downstairs talking to the Hodgson family, and all of a sudden he knocked on the ceiling to us. Vic was, was a builder, so he understood about creaking buildings and rattling drain pipes and rats and things, and he, he heard this knocking and agreed that it was not normal. He said, I can hear everything banging on that floor, and we're all standing still. He said, I don't know what to do. And he looked worried then. And i never seen a man like this big, because he was a big bloke, honestly, and looking scared. In the end, we got on, I think, um, they got on to the police. I think the, the police child... duly arrived. There seemed no obvious cause for the strange sounds, but with youngsters living in the house, there was the possibility of a childish prank. Well, I, I couldn't believe my... And we explained what was going on in that, and... Um, I think the lady officer actually saw the chair move or rise. It um, came off the floor, or nearly a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't, it didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. 
after about an hour, they said, well, there's nothing we can do. We've looked around. We can't find anybody outside, and we don't know if there's anything in the, under the house or anything. We'll have to get somebody else to investigate this, because we can't explain it, they said. Whatever was happening at Green Street had baffled the police, Peggy Hodgson, and her neighbours. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do, Vic. I'm going to phone the paper. Events were to take an even stranger turn. I wasn't sure what was happening or what was supposed to be happening, but there is no question that things were flying around the room. We were just literally standing there with a camera and a flash gun turned on and waiting to see what happened. And um, things did. <laughs> It was very unnerving. It could have been over in just moments. I don't really remember. It seemed like years at the time. It just went on and on. Vince and Morris waited until things calmed down and then left to file their report. Graham and I sort of debriefed ourselves on the way back and, and uh, just checked that we weren't kidding each other. But when the photographs were developed the next day, they failed to show what Benson Morris reported seeing. It was so frustrating on that first night for things to have happened but not to be able to capture anything conclusive. Independent or apparently independent witnesses reporting that they both saw something happen, then we treat that as having very high evidential value. The problem is in the real world, if you think you've seen something very unusual, you will discuss it with each other. And one person's account is likely to influence another. So someone may have seen something vaguely out of the corner of their eye and not been sure what it was, but by the time they've finished talking to someone, they've become convinced that they actually saw a book fly off a shelf or whatever it may be. There is no question that things were flying around the room, Lego bricks and marbles. What we had with the Enfield case was a situation where, for whatever reason, it seemed to be notoriously difficult to actually record much of this stuff on film. The Mirror team returned, hoping to capture those elusive images. But in the days that followed, the journalists became so worried about the family that they appealed for specialist help from the Society for Psychical Research. The Society was set up in 1882 to investigate um, those faculties of man, real or supposed, that are not explicable on any generally recognised hypothesis. Well, in other words, it is to look into weird things. The present-day SPR um, has a wide range of membership, ranging from complete sceptics, I'm, I'm a member of the SPR myself, um, to, at the other extreme, people who are convinced that paranormal forces really do exist. In 1977, the SPR had a new member, an inventor named Morris Gross, who had joined the society after losing his daughter in a tragic accident. When the call about Enfield came in, he jumped at the chance and headed for Green Street. I didn't know really what to expect. I didn't know whether it was a real hoax. Perhaps the children and the mother were having a right game with the press. I thought, this is very, very unlikely. Anyway, I kept my mind fairly clear on it. I went to the house, I went in. As soon as I got in, I could see everybody was very disturbed. The children were disturbed, the mother was very disturbed, and the people from the Daily Mirror were very disturbed. What was happening was so alien to anything else I'd, I'd seen before. The interesting thing here was that the mother and the children had no, not a clue what a poltergeist was. When I first said the word, this looks like poltergeist-type phenomena, they hadn't got a clue what I was talking about. So he said, well, look, you're not on your own, Mr Gross, and he said, I'm, I'm going to make sure that you're not left on your own to feel frightened anymore. And she thanked him and she said, I'm sorry about it, Mr Gross, I just don't know what to do. She was very desperate. Gross was quickly convinced by the mysterious atmosphere and goings-on at the Hodgson house. After spending a few days and nights there, he felt he was in over his head and needed someone to help him deal with the situation. Guy Lyon Playfair was a writer and journalist with a background in paranormal investigation. 
I thought this sounds like the real stuff, so I thought I'd pop in once or twice and um, ended up staying there for 14 months. Two weeks after the original disturbances, the investigators began camping out in the Hodgson home, convinced by now that they were dealing with a genuine poltergeist. The word poltergeist literally means kind of noisy spirit or mischievous spirit. Poltergeist activity is what we call psychokinetic activity. Objects are thrown around. Things disappearing and turning up somewhere else. Buzzing, knocking on the walls, bangings. Uh, I mean, even to the point of, of earth shaking. Things shooting around the room at colossal speed. Smells, nasty smells. This sometimes goes on for weeks, months, very occasionally for years. It seems to have an intelligence, and that intelligence is um, destructive, mischievous. With no intention of harming, and that if anybody is injured, uh, it's an accident. The phenomena starts off in a small way and builds up over time, much as uh, it does in other areas of parapsychology. If there's the will to do it for whatever reason, you get a sort of uh, feedback where you're creating, um, you're creating a ghost, really. The Daily Mirror coverage had attracted the attention of BBC Radio, who dispatched a young reporter to the house in Enfield to investigate. It was a very light news day and we didn't have enough stuff to fill the programme and I was sort of threatened, if nothing else comes in, you'll have to go off on this ghost story. Well, the first night when I arrived, uh, Maurice Gross was there and um, he explained to me what he thought was going on and then the family went to sleep and we waited to see if anything would happen. Well, we've just heard a noise having come downstairs. We've just heard a noise upstairs and the chair, which was standing by Janet's bed, appears to have moved. The chair's been thrown nine feet. Well, I'm hoping I'm not getting uh, the microphone shaking in my hand because that was rather an unnerving experience. Mm. I mean, we all know kids can fake being asleep, but it didn't look like that. It looked as though she had been asleep um, and suddenly something had happened. You can look back into history, you can find that there are cases recorded from hundreds and hundreds of years ago where this kind of activity was reported. In many cases, they're not absolutely always, there is somebody in the house, usually, uh, frequently a, a, an adolescent child, who appears to be what one calls the poltergeist centre. Other poltergeist cases involving adolescent girls or young women include the Bell Witch in Tennessee in 1817, the Rosenheim case in Germany, and that of Virginia Campbell in Scotland in the 1960s. I was amazed to find that it was often related to the onset of puberty, and Janet and Margaret were both at that stage in their lives. In cases like Enfield, some parapsychologists believe that poltergeists are the spirits of the dead. Others say that the disturbances are caused by unknown energies produced by the girls themselves. Skeptics have a different take. The focus of the activity is the troubled adolescent, but they don't tend to think anything paranormal is happening. They tend to assume that this is some kind of attention-seeking behaviour and that, essentially, we're looking at hoaxes and trickery. Whatever the explanation for what was going on, the family had taken to sleeping in the same room when, in late October 1977, activity escalated. There's an old fireplace in the bedroom, the old type of fireplace. Janet said to me, I can hear this scraping sound. And she said, oh my God, the fireplace is moving. Then there was this tremendous vibrating noise. And I really thought someone was drilling a hole in the, in the wall of the house. It was kind of um, very, very, very violent shaking. And so I tore into the bedroom and there was already quite a commotion. And all at once, the front of the fireplace lifted up and it lifted right over the double bed. And it just came out with such force. And then I think there was a pipe attached to something else, but even something as forceful as a poltergeist couldn't quite wrench that. Well, here you have the gas fire, different parts of the gas fire. All I can tell you is it's so heavy, I can't pick it up. <laughs> um, that's how heavy all the stuff is together. They were heavy and they could arm us. So Mr Gross took it away, he took it all out. 
The next day it all went. And how do you bend that pipe, let alone pull it out of the wall? I mean, the children couldn't, the children couldn't possibly have done it. Impossible. With no answer in sight, Gross contacted London University, who sent a student of experimental physics to test Janet and see if she could influence metal in the same way as the celebrated spoon bender of the time, Yuri Geller. I told her what to do, that she should put her hand towards the piece of metal, but not get any closer than about six inches away from it, and just try to make it bend. This is the record I took at the time. Within a minute and a half or so of actually starting, we, we begin to get the first few signals, and they're gradually increasing in size. By the end of it, she'd successfully bent the metal, and um, that was with no touch. Uh, I, I don't know whether I felt gifted or special. I just felt like an ordinary girl, really, at that time. Janet was extremely lively. Um distinctly what you might call an extrovert. I considered to be a very intelligent child. The others were much quieter children in that respect. Uh, M Margaret was rather nervous child. Janet wasn't. Janet was all for it, you see. If Janet was the source of the energy, then the reason for the disturbances might be found in the Hodgson family and its recent history. You'd never get a poltergeist happening in a perfectly happy family. So I knew before I even went there that there was going to be some kind of problem. There's some major upheaval shortly before these um, phenomena occur. Well, Mum and Dad were together uh, when we were children, obviously, but they split up uh, when I was about the age of nine, ten years old. My parents divorcing when we were so young, something there didn't help it. It, it, and it gradually, you know, it pulled it all apart, I think, really. Life, it just didn't seem the same once Mum and Dad split up. The father used to come to the house to hand over his maintenance money. Two girls didn't like him, they were rather frightened of him, and he brought his girlfriend on one or two occasions, and that, of course, really upset their mother. It was a hell of a situation. The worst type of divorce situation you could come across as far as stress was concerned. The um, family was quite poor, actually, and um, they were doing their best to get on. It is very difficult uh, with one parent bringing up the children alone, um, not having much money struggling to make ends meet. She was a very brave woman. Now, how she was keeping that family together, I don't know. Life wasn't getting any easier for Peggy Hodgson, and two months on from the first incidents, mystifying noises continued to plague the family. It doesn't sound very odd, really, does it, to say, um, oh, we heard someone going knock, 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 knock on a, on a wall. But actually, it was sort of up the middle of the wall or high up. So we'll say the knocking is on the wall over there. You go to listen to the knocking on the wall over there, and suddenly it will come from that wall over there. And when you go to listen there, it will come from the ceiling. That, that's the sort of thing that happens. It wasn't a noise um, that seemed as you would if someone had a hammer and was knocking next door or was um, knocking on the door at any point. It was, it, was entire, it was always on the walls and it always, and it was really thumping rather than knocking. There was a lot of thumping. The mysterious sounds were captured by TV reporter Stuart Lamont when he visited the house in Green Street. So we conducted a couple of interviews with the girls, and in one of them, I was asking them about uh, when the phenomena began, and then suddenly, halfway through the interview, there was a loud knocking noise. I think it was three knocks. Um, I can't remember exactly when. Um, what, what's that knocking? Yeah, that's, I was doing that yesterday morning. And it's doing it again now. 
in the atmosphere, in the context that we were filming, of course, everyone was quiet. There was nothing going on. And people would be aware of interruptions and noise. And, of course, everyone was immediately aware that something had, had gone on and nobody in that room had caused it. I mean, I don't know whether it was caused by the family, with, with Janet as the main person um, causing it, um, or whether it was something else trying to get in. I, I've no idea. I mean, I don't even want to speculate on that. I, um, I just think it was, it was just very, very strange and I've never heard anything like it before or since. If uh, you or I kind of hear some kind of noise in our house, we don't immediately think it's a poltergeist. But once you've got this mindset that there is a poltergeist in the house, then anything, no matter how mundane, is explained in terms of the poltergeist. The Hodgsons continued to report disturbances night after night, and by late October they seemed to be at breaking point. Morris Gross and Guy Playfair decided to send the family away from the house. They went for a week's holiday to Clacton-on-Sea. I went on vacation because things were getting so bad for them, I got very, very worried about them. It was nice, nice break. But then we knew we had to go back to reality and what would it bring? After a few days' break from the reported poltergeist activity in their infield home, the Hodgson family returned, as did the disturbances, with a vengeance. We seem to be getting a lot more happening on this case than, than uh, on any other case that I've been involved in. And uh, there were times when I wondered if it was really ever going to stop. Damn it! We could hear this knock, and it seemed all over the floor. But Morris came in. And, and he said, I wonder if it could answer me. I challenged this knocking, and I, I said, Did you give me one knock for no and two knocks for yes? Do you understand me? Did you die in this house? It knocked 53 times. Then my patience gave out. I said, Are you having a game with me? And suddenly there was a shh. Oh. Right. Oh, gross. Oh. As I asked the, as I asked the question, the Are you having a game you. with me? It threw, it threw the, the cardboard box <laughs> and the pillow right at my face. The box from the corner of the room took off flew across the bed and hit me on the forehead and knocked me back. Well, if I wanted proof, that was it. I mean, there was no better proof in the world of anything than that. This box had taken off, shot across the bed, hit me on the forehead. Gross and Playfair were convinced that the case was genuine, but others who visited the house from the Society for Psychical Research found no evidence of paranormal activity. In particular, Anita Gregory and John Belloff during their stay in the house, they felt that all of the phenomena that took place were deliberate hoaxes on the part of the children. There was a kind of um, opposition that went to the extreme of saying, well, we don't believe a word of it. You know, there's, there's nothing happening. It's just a lot of hysterical people. There have been a number of poltergeist cases believed to be deliberate hoaxes. The most famous of these is the Amityville Horror, closely followed in 1984 by that of Tina Resch, an adolescent girl from Columbus, Ohio, who seemingly faked a series of paranormal events, some of which were caught on camera. The Enfield case, I think, is, is, a, is a good case where lots of people, I think, would find the evidence quite ambiguous. We can have no doubt at all that there is some deliberate hoaxing and trickery going on in this case, but the proponents who argue that it was a genuine poltergeist case will say that not all of the evidence can be explained away that way. Children were perfectly okay. They, they played a few tricks, which, which, which I would have been very surprised if they hadn't. And we caught them, and they, they knew we'd caught them, and we just didn't discuss it. it was no big deal. Yes, there were times when the children played around. Of course there were, uh, one particular time. I remember this one very vividly. I came one morning, about half past eight in the morning, 
and Janet excitedly came up to me and said, the poltergeist has pinched your tape recorder. I started to look around. I found the tape recorder. Because what Janet didn't know was the tape recorder was still running when they pinched it. And when I played it back, it said, oh, of course, let's play a trick on him or two. And it was say the poltergeist did it. That sort of stunt. He was on the ball with everything that happened. And he knew, in a sense, whether we were playing the odd little game when we weren't. But it was not all fun and games. In late November 1977, three months into the case, Janet produced a series of highly disturbing drawings. Meanwhile, her behavior began to give serious cause for concern. We did have some pretty hairy moments, yes. I think when Janet was having these kind of trance uh, fits, rather like an epileptic fit, where she would develop phenomenal strength. Go away from me, go away! When she was violent, Janet, she would sometimes rush across the room and bash her head on the wall. And I, I was fri fri even frightened at one time she might kill herself. Most likely he was possessed by an evil spirit or something, even though you don't like to think it, you know. She seemed to be taken over. I hate to use this word possession, see, because I'm not quite sure what it means. But she seemed to be taken over and she was very angry and she used to scream and shout and swear and we used to have to physically restrain her. On the 26th of November, a doctor came to the house and injected Janet with 10 milligrams of Valium in an effort to sedate her. I can, I can actually remember when I found myself on a radiogram in the bedroom on top of Chester Jaws, I think, and I was screaming, how did I get there, how did I get there, you know, and I think my uncle John came into the bedroom. There she is across this radio, one leg in the air, and her head hanging down. Janet's restlessness continued with the most intense activity taking place at night. One of the most disturbing episodes was captured on tape by Morris Gross. Janet's asleep, and suddenly she's being dragged out of bed. She's dragged to the door, the door opens on its own. She goes through the door and we, we heard the commotion upstairs. We rushed up the stairs and caught her coming down the stairs head first. Janet, where is she? I don't know. I'll try oh, to get out the room and I couldn't. Tell me what happened. I was in bed asleep. Yeah. Looks had and I felt something pull me by the arms out of bed. Yeah. The door opened and I went out the door and I come flying downstairs. <laughs> In an effort to understand what was happening to Janet, the investigators decided to ask Ian Fletcher, a fellow SPR member and a medical doctor, to hypnotize her. I put her into a light state of uh, hypnosis and then asked her various questions. I said to Janet, do you know who is doing all this? Uh, she said, uh, me and my sister. And then she said, I don't know who it is. And then she told me she'd been thrown out of bed. I said, what did it feel like? Then she said, cold hands gripping her, gripping her round the body. The impression I formed was, this is not fraud. She, and perhaps her sister, are doing some of these things, maybe springing out of bed, but why are they springing out of bed? Something is forcing them to do it against their will. Janet was captured more than once on film by Graham Morris, who set up a camera that he could activate remotely when he heard noise coming from the upstairs of the house. I think motor drives in those days were about four frames a second, so everything was, was a, you know, a, quarter of a, frame, a quarter of a second apart. Um, and it showed Janet coming from one side of the room up and across and then landing on the floor at the foot 
of her sister's bed. Um, all the people in the know seemed to think it was levitation. Sometimes you felt like hands or something. You felt like you were pulled out of bed. It looked like something working outside of her, but it's working on her as well, you know? It was strange. It's quite a frightening experience in a sense, especially when you levitated with force and not knowing where you were going to land. It's just like an invisible person with her, helping her, I don't know. Much of this stuff on film is open to interpretation. It could just as easily be someone leaping into the air. We know that Janet was a very athletic young girl. But we didn't actually get any kind of, you know, convincing footage of Janet rising into the air or being thrown against a wall or any of these kind of things. What we've got is all this very ambiguous, very dodgy evidence. The 14th of December was to be highly significant. It was both the date of Janet's first period and a day on which two passers-by would describe seeing events that defied belief. When the uh, baker's roundsman, who delivered bread next door, was coming along the road, he heard a tremendous commotion in the Hudson house. And he looked up, the curtains had been pulled across, he looked up and he saw Janet floating around the room in a horizontal position like this, followed by some books and toys. But at the same time, across the road, is a lollipop lady. I saw Janet laying flat and she was floating. She was going up and down in front of the bedroom window. And I think at one point, because I was hitting the window, they actually thought, well, I might come through the window, you know? I mean, it was quite a frightening experience, really. I came home and I kept thinking about it and I thought to myself, well, maybe she was doing it herself, I don't know. So I came straight in, took my coat off, my hat, went straight upstairs to my own bed, laid on my own bed and tried to lift myself up horizontally and you couldn't do it. We know from mountains and mountains of psychological research that eyewitness testimony can be notoriously unreliable. She was just there. She was just there in front of the window. I can see it now as plain as day. People are absolutely convinced that they've seen really, really amazing, weird stuff when perhaps, in fact, if we could only just replay the tape, which we can't, and see what really happened, we'd find that it wasn't quite like that. I said to Janet, um, I think that voice is coming from you. She said, oh, no, it ain't. I said, Janet, I think it is coming from you. She says it's not. I said, well, if it's not coming from you, where is it coming from? I felt a lot of the time it was coming from behind me, not from me. How do you do it, mate? Do you feel it vibrating as if it was sort of... Um, no, like someone... Someone what? Got their hands on the back of my neck, like that. There was occasions when... I'm sure, thinking back, that Morris would take my mouth up or fill my mouth with water. I've got to take some water in her mouth, taped over her mouth, and it still spoke. And then I said, all right, and I took the tape off, and uh, she spat the water out. Now, as far as I know, there's not a, a ventriloquist in the world that can do that. It was a sort of uh, rather um, almost theatrical thing, growling. How many voices are there? 600. 600 the voices? I know, a joke. How uh, many really are there, Margaret? I think so far we've had 10 Three. Um, sensible voices. Because the girls, uh, uh, particularly Janet, had slightly protruding teeth at the time, it was impossible to see anyway whether her lips were moving, so the voice seemed to be coming from the larynx. On an analysis, on an oscilloscope, you can tell exactly how the voice was made, and we found the voice was not made by the larynx, but by the false vocal fold, which is above the larynx. And you only use that if you talk like that.
Well, if you talk like that for too long, you get a very bad throat and you can do yourself permanent damage. I did try to do the voice myself and um, I, I tried to, I managed to keep it up for a few minutes and then I had a sore throat for two days afterwards. This voice used to speak up to three hours, not continuously, of course, up to three hours at a time without Janet showing any distress whatsoever. Is anybody there? No, no. Who's there? Doctor. It was all very childish, actually. A lot of it was very childish, and it was, there were some swear words sometimes. Don't be annoyed, Uh, some of the things it said were very embarrassing, you know, for instance, the swearing. Yes, fucking hell, stop. Uh, it was like, in a sense, that it was angry. 54. Oh, 64. This apparent possession, this being taken over by something from outside, gives licence to people to behave in ways that perhaps they really want to but can't due to social conventions. So the idea of a teenager suddenly being able to swear, use all these obscenities, without anybody coming back and telling them that this was unacceptable, that is actually quite something. We thought it was just Janet mucking about. And so, um, uh, you know, as there was so much emphasis laid on this voice, uh, people, well, as I say, a sort of opposition party sprang up saying this is just a load of nonsense. I wasn't overly convinced by it, I must say. I'm sorry, I, I just found that a bit... I just thought the whole thing had just got a bit ridiculous after a while as well, and, and it was almost as if certain things were expected by the, by the scientists and the, the people who were there to study it. But just as the credibility of the voice seemed in question, it would provide startling evidence to challenge those who doubted it. The Hodgson family of Enfield were the apparent victims of a poltergeist attack. But when the children began to produce strange voices, some thought they were simply play-acting. Morris Gross believed one of the voices to be that of a discarnate spirit named Bill and asked his son Richard, a solicitor, to interrogate it. I'm standing outside of the room. I desperately want to see inside the room. I want to see what's happening with Janet. I want to see if her mouth is moving, what her face looks like. I thought, I will look through the crack in the door. And just at that very moment, it said to me, Shut up, I'm not looking through, don't worry. I thought, that's pretty impressive. I've had my mind read there, so I thought I would ask it some questions about what I, what I thought might inform me about what a ghost was or a poltergeist was. I want you to tell me whether you remember what happened to you when you died. I went blind. Then I had an hemorrhage and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in a corner downstairs. This really was undeniably an old man's voice. Certainly not the voice of, a, of an 11-year-old girl. Uh, uh, that, it actually never occurred to me uh, in a way that this could be anything other than an old man's voice. Some months later, Gross was contacted by Terry Wilkins, whose father Bill was buried in a nearby cemetery and had lived at the house before the Hodgsons moved in. I had an hemorrhage and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in a corner downstairs. Astonishingly, the voice had described the precise circumstances of Bill Wilkins' death. But it describes exactly how That's he exactly what happened. He died in the chair, down in the living room. Uh, my mum popped out to the shop for ten minutes. Mm -hmm. When she came back, he was dead. Is it who it says it is, or is it some psychic joker having a game with us? And I have a strong suspicion that in poltergeist cases, we've got a psychic joker at work. It may have been Bill, well, I don't know, it may have been Bill, according to Terry Wilkins, his son, it was his father. But how do we know it wasn't some entity impersonating his father? You see all these questions it throws up. Nothing is straightforward. God, I wish it was. Save me a few headaches. In July 1978, almost a year after the disturbances began, 
Peggy Hodgson, with the help of Gross and Playfair, had Janet admitted to the Maudsley Hospital for psychiatric testing. I think she felt that like if I went into hospital to have tests, I would benefit by, and she would benefit by knowing that I was normal. And things would die down at home. They gave her every possible test you can think of, and they prodded her all over, and they took her brain waves and everything else. She, she was as normal as they come. After two months in hospital, Janet returned home with a clean bill of health. Seemingly, the situation in the house had calmed down. Like all poltergeist cases, they eventually start to diminish. And uh, I personally, and this is my own opinion, is that they start to diminish because the stress starts to reduce. Even though they died down and they stopped, I, I always felt there's always something there. I don't know about now, but while Mum was there, there was always something there. Peggy Hodgson continued to live in the house in Green Street until her death in 2003. Janet and Margaret have gone on to lead normal lives. In the years since the case ended, nobody has changed their account of what happened, even though some were offered money by the press to do so. There are good, strong reasons to doubt that keep the debate going. And the thing, this will run and run. I don't think people will probably ever lose interest, but I'm also equally sure that nobody will ever come up with a definitive explanation of what went on all those years ago. I haven't spent the last nearly 30 years thinking about this. In fact, I've tried not to think about it because I don't actually, I did find it very disturbing. If it was put on, and if it was all faked, and it was cleverly manipulated, then all I can say is that family were very, very clever. I know, from my own experiences, that it was real. And it did happen. Call me whatever you like, a prank. Mad, whatever. I would put it in the sort of middle rank of poltergeists where things move, things misbehave, things are thrown, and... Um, uh, you know, fairly well observed by fairly reasonable people. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't have seen it myself, but I don't expect anyone else to believe it just because I say so. But it did. I know what I saw, and it was weird. This was real-life mystery. Marvellous. I don't want to do it again, though, thanks. <laughs> Once is enough. They'd become part of history. Well... Who knows if that wasn't what they were supposed to do? You know, I, I don't like to be mystical at all, but who knows whether that wasn't their destiny from the word go. Sometimes I'm scared of the dark or I'm jumpy. And I jump even at work over the slightest thing if someone comes up behind me and they just can't make out why and I can't tell them. Because that's what it leaves you with, this thing you've experienced, you know. I just felt as a person they were to do with me and I didn't feel in control. I felt used, I still say used. <laughs>